Good morning. I love that phrase, walking from earth into eternity. The songwriter captured a truth there that this is all very temporary and we're moving into all that is very eternal, all that is spiritual. Wonderful to have you here today. Thank you, musicians, for leading us in worship. Children, we're loving having you here, but we'll dismiss you into children's ministry. God bless you as you go. Would you pray for them as all of them head out? Pray that God would speak truth to their hearts. The Holy Spirit would take these truths and implant them deep, ground them. How many of you have ever been to a really, really excellent performance or a play or a musical? Raise your hands. Yeah. They're riveting, aren't they? It's been a number of months ago now. We were privileged to go with my wife's parents and her sister to New York City. And one of the things we did there was went to one of the musicals there on Broadway. It was absolutely amazing. Every scene, every act, I was just expecting something wonderful and good. We usually don't think of prophets as performers, appropriately so. They're not performers. But what's interesting is the prophets were often called to do more than just stand up and speak the truth. They were often called to act out truth, to perform the truth, to really get the attention of the people. Isaiah, he was asked to walk naked in front of the people. I bet that got their attention. Ezekiel was told to lay down on your side for a long period of time in front of the people. And then later on, he was told to go get a sharp sword and shave your head and take a third of it and burn it, and then take another third and burn it, and another third and burn it, and he did this in front of the people. And of course, Hosea, his whole prophetic life was acting out the truth because God said, Hosea, I want you to go and marry a prostitute. Make her your own. Devote your life to her because I want the people to see that that's exactly what I've done to them. So their lives were oftentimes this presentation of truth, not just standing and speaking the truth. So Jeremiah, as we're in this series, is asked to do that often. To perform the truth in front of the people. And so what we see in our text today is what I call Jeremiah's four-act prophetic performance. What we're going to see is him act out the truth because the people needed to hear the truth. Now, before we move on to our text or to the performance, I, I don't want you to miss something kind of at the 30,000-foot level as we consider this. God is serious about making himself known to people. He's serious about his truth being communicated. He really does want us to understand him. He wants people to know him. He's not trying to hide himself at all. And often he asks those who communicate his truth to go to great pains to make sure that the people understand what God wants to make known. So understand, anybody that stands in front of people regularly to present the truth, they, they know that challenge. I know that challenge. Understand, the challenge of preaching is never having something to say. We have a whole book of things to say. It's all there. I, I know what to say. Anybody that stands up knows what to say. The challenge is to present it in a way that this amazing truth that God says, I want the people to know, it actually gets to them. You don't want to be too dry. You don't want to be too creative. And here's what we know as we read the pages of Scripture. God uses many different methods, and he asks his communicators to use many different methods to make sure that the people actually get the truth of God. Let's pray this morning that God would give us ears to hear his truth. 
Father, thank you for the truth that we have today preserved for us, your written word, and, and that it's, it's given to us, it's been preserved for us. And we have the Holy Spirit, Lord, and we pray the Holy Spirit would teach us and open our ears to hear what we need to hear. Thank you, God, for being so good that you would make yourself known in this way. Amen. So here's Act 1. It's in Jeremiah chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to me, Go and buy yourself a linen waistband and put it around your waist, but do not put it in water. So I bought the waistband in accordance with the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. So here we have a waistband. It's like God says, I want you to do this in front of the people. So here it is. Now it's not linen. It's actually a bathrobe. It's terry cloth or whatever it is, okay? So go buy it and put it around your waist. Now what's the significance of that? That word translated in our up on the screen there, waistband, sometimes it's belt or girdle or sash or loin cloth. And I'm sure you already know that what Jeremiah was wearing and what all the men were wearing, that was much different than what we wear, right guys? We recognize that. You know that, that their garments were robe-like, long and flowing. But in addition to how the men dressed, we need to understand a little bit about what the priests were wearing and the significance of this linen, this white waistband to the priests. I want you to remember that Jeremiah was from the tribe of Levi. He was in, in, uh, kind of in the line to be one of the priests until God says, no, you're not going to be a priest. You're going to be my prophet. So a waistband would have been very common for men to wear because they had these, this robe-like thing and for them to get around and not get that tied up and everything, they, they took something, they tied it around their waist maybe a couple times to hold everything tight against them. But the priests, and this is important, it was a little more significant than that. There was some symbolism in this. And I wanted to just show you three Old Testament passages so you understand. I'll just show you these quickly. I think you'll get the point. So this, first of all, goes to Exodus chapter 28. Talking to Moses, God says, Bring near to yourself Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from among the tribes of Israel to minister as priests to me. So this was the tribe. These were the priests, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Athamar, Aaron's sons. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. That's an important phrase. These garments are for glory and for beauty. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastpiece and an ephod and a robe and a tunic of checkered work and a turban and a sash. That's the translation there. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister as priest to me. These were important garments that the priests do or have. It was part of their service before the Lord. It's what made them be able to serve the way they were. We go to the book of Le Leviticus, chapter 16. And he shall put on the holy linen tunic, and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body, and it shall be girded with the linen sash, and attired with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. One more passage in Exodus. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a what? Read it out loud. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now he's talking to the nation as a whole. Now we had these specific priests that had a particular function within the nation, but the nation as a whole, God is saying, this whole nation is a holy nation of kingdom priests. So from those passages, I want us to see that this sash or waistband that Jeremiah put on was not just any old piece of cloth, 
It was to be linen. How many know what linen's made of? Cotton. Wrong! This is my big learning moment. This is my big learning curve this week, all right? I said, well, what is this linen stuff? It's made from the flax plant. It's not cotton. It's made from flax. And it is the strongest natural fiber that we have. There's a good reason. God says, make it of linen. This is good stuff. So all of the priest's garments were to be made from linen. And I have a picture for you. That, so this would be what the, not the high priest. The high priest had a whole different garb. But the priest looked like this. It was all white. It was all linen. And you can see the waistband. And you can understand as they served, they were actually serving around fire quite a bit. Use this waistband to make sure that this robe doesn't get caught up in the flame and, and all these things. But it symbolized something as well, that they were serving the God. They were serving a holy God. So that phrase in Exodus chapter 19 is very important. The whole nation... The whole nation is to be serving God, is holy to God, is to be worshiping God. So in this first act, there's some very significant things being communicated. The people were being reminded as Jeremiah put on this waistband that they were a nation of priests. They were to be holy. They were to be serving God. They were to be set apart to God. They had a particular and peculiar purpose before God. They were to be a pure and devoted people, and this unfolds as we go through the Acts. But at this point in time, they weren't, and that was the problem. They had become dirty and unfaithful and soiled and divided in their loyalty. So we go to the next illustration, or the next point, the water. Jeremiah is given a curious command, don't put this thing in water. There was all kinds of speculation on what that exactly means. I, sim I think the simple understanding is, Jeremiah, don't wash it. Just wear it all the time, but don't wash it. Everywhere he went, doing everything that he did, over and over again, every day he put on this same linen white waist cloth or belt, and after a time, what would happen to it? It's a no-brainer, right? It would get dirty. But don't wash it, Jeremiah. Don't wash it. It would just get dirtier and dirtier and dirtier, but he was never to wash it. It was never to go into the water. Now, we don't know how long this went on, but long enough that eventually this was looking very, very soiled. Now, I don't know if I'm the only guy that ever does this, but sometimes when I get home and I'm going to go to bed, I'll take my pants off and I hold them up. They still look pretty clean to me. You guys ever do that? We can wear those again. We don't need to wash them. Every once in a while, though, Kim will be there and say, yeah, you need to wash that. You better wash that. Or I'll put some pants on. He says, you didn't wash those, did you? No, no, they looked good to me. So here's what I want to understand. It's like these, this, this thing is getting dirty all the time. It's like, don't wash it. It's just getting dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. It was getting filthy. It's almost like what God is communicating, the nation is filthy. The nation is dirty, but you can't see it. And, and I want you to understand that this, this linen, white, beautiful, very symbolic piece of, uh, of the priest's wardrobe was getting filthy, and it's obvious to me, but they weren't getting it. So imagine the people watching Jeremiah. Now remember, Jeremiah has already stood at the gate of the temple and, and proclaimed a huge message. So they know who Jeremiah was, and now Jeremiah is walking around with this white, uh, long, flowing sash or belt or girdle, whatever you want to call it. And people say, well, that's, that's interesting. That's what the priests wear. And then imagine as he keeps wearing it, it just gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier, and they're probably thinking, what? Why doesn't he wash it? See, it's just getting the attention of the people in a very, very practical way. That's Act 1, moving on to Act 2, starting in verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to me a second time, saying, Take the waistband that you have bought, which is around your waist, arise and go to the Euphrates and hide it there in the crevice of a rock. So I went and hid it in by the Euphrates as the Lord had commanded me. Now, we don't know how long this went on, but 
Of course, the linen waste cloth is now very dirty, and he's told, take it off and go hide it. And it's interesting, on the text you see up there, it says Euphrates. There's a couple different things that could be meant there in the Hebrew. It could mean actually the Euphrates River. Some think it doesn't mean that because the Euphrates River is a hundred, hundreds of miles away. So for Jeremiah to do this was going to take him literally weeks of travel to go bury it by the Euphrates River. So some say certainly God couldn't have expected him to do that. And I push back on that a little bit. I think that's exactly what God expected him to do. As he'd been in front of the people and he had all the attention of the people, now he's gone. And he's traveled all this distance, all the way to the Euphrates River and then all the way back. And now he's standing in front of the people without his waistband. Again, that got their attention. Another option from the Hebrew is that it was a paphra or uh, an area near Jerusalem or near Bethlehem, which was only about six miles away, so it would have been a very short trip. Regardless of where Jeremiah took the waist cloth, the point was being made. This, this symbol, this waist cloth that was representing the people, something was going to happen to them. They were going to be taken away, literally. This people who were set apart to him, that were to be holy to him, that were to serve him, now were being taken away to do something that God never intended for them. So then we have the rock. Jeremiah is told to put the waist cloth in the crevice of a rock. And it was to be hidden in the dark, in the dirt, exposed to the moisture. As I'm thinking about it, if it was near the Euphrates, as the river rose, it would get damp. And then it would recede and it would just settle down into the dirt again. And this happens over and over again. The people of God, he's saying, soon you're going to be in captivity. Soon you're going to be hidden away. You're going to be taken far from your land. Far from the glory that God intended for them. So the second act is very short and so we move to act three. After many days, the Lord said to me, Arise, go to the Euphrates, and take from there the waistband which I commanded you to hide there. And then I went to the Euphrates, and I dug, and I took the waistband from the place where I had hidden it, and lo, the waistband was what? It was ruined. It was worthless. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, Just so will I destroy the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem. So at this, this third act that we see the main point, and the point is ruin and worthlessness. This beautiful linen belt around his waist that everybody noticed, it was once bright, it was once beautiful, now it's ruined, it's of no profit. The fiber had been broken down, it was rotten and dirty, far from its intended use. God's trying to make a point here, isn't he? God is serious about his people. God is serious about those that he has chosen and that he has called. He has purposes for them. He has made them what he intended them to be. Now, it's really important that we see in this text that his intent is not to ruin them. It actually says very specifically his intent is to ruin what? Do you see it? The pride. I will destroy the pride of Judah. I will destroy the great pride of Jerusalem. See, the people had become arrogant. The people had felt independent, self-secure. They had forgotten God's sovereign choosing of them. They had forgotten God's providential protection of them. They had forgotten the gracious blessing that had been given to them. They had forgot that it all started with God and they were only maintained and sustained by God and they became independent in their thinking. They became proud people. And it was their pride that needed to be dealt with. It's interesting to go all the way back to God's communication to these people you go all the way back to the book of Leviticus, he says, now if you obey me, 
If you walk in my statutes, if you stay humble before me, I'll bring blessing to you. But if you choose to disobey me, it's not going to go well. He's very clear about that. And then there's this one interesting place where he points out the pride that could arise. In Leviticus 26, he says this, I will break down your pride of power. Now, when, when you become disobedient to me, he's saying it's because of an issue of pride, and I'm going to break it down. I will make your sky like iron, your earth like bronze, your strength will be spent uselessly. All that you think you are, all that you think you might have done will just be spent and you'll be powerless. See, through this prophetic performance of Jeremiah, he's stating something in a very creative way that is repeated over and over in the canon of Scripture that pride always has a devastating end. Going back to the very, very beginning, wasn't it pride in the garden? Wasn't it even pride of the serpent that I'll be like God? Wasn't it pride in the mind of Adam and Eve that, yeah, I think we have a better plan than God? Wasn't it pride later on in the book of Genesis when the people said, we're going to build a tower because we're great and we're strong, and God brought an end to that, didn't he? Over and over again, Scripture talks about the issue of pride, and it always connects pride with destruction. Let me just show you three, all in Proverbs. When pride comes, then comes what? Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before what? Proverbs 29, a man's pride will bring him... It's just the axiom, it's the truth of Scripture. When people are proud and boastful and sense, somehow sense an independence of God, God will deal with it. The New Testament affirms this within a statement made by the Apostle Peter and the Apostle James. This is by Peter. He says, you younger men likewise be subject to your elders, and all of you close yourselves with what? Humility. Why? Because <laughs> God's opposed to the proud. He will bring the proud down, but he'll give grace. He'll extend his blessing to the humble. I love this analogy made by David Rhodes who wrote about pride. He says this, pride is the dandelion of the soul. Its roots go deep. Only a little left behind sprouts again. Its seeds lodge in the tiniest encouraging cracks and it flourishes in good soil the danger of pride is that it feeds on goodness dandelions are beautiful little flowers aren't they no they're deadly weeds but they look good and there's almost a sense of beauty about them And they're tenacious, and if they're not dealt with, they indeed take over. Understand, here's the message. God has chosen his people. God had made his people strong. God had made his people prosperous. God had provided and made them a very beautiful people. And those blessings should have reminded them that they are hopelessly dependent on God for everything. But it did just the opposite. It made them independent and self-reliant. They could live independent of God and not necessarily obey what he says. They could do things a little bit better. And so I want to repeat what I shared a couple weeks ago. Deep at the core of our human condition is pride, a desire to exalt ourselves and minimize God, a desire and an attempt to figure it out ourselves and minimize what God has so clearly told us as if we can do that a little bit better. That's at the root evil of the human condition. The truth manifested in a quote by Ted Turner who said this, if I only had a little humility, I'd be perfect. Yeah, there it is, pride. So in this final act, we see the fruit of this pride in the hearts and lives of the people. Verse 10 this wicked people 
who refuses to listen to my words, who walk in the stubbornness of their hearts and have gone after other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. Let them be just like this waistband, which is totally worthless. Notice, first of all, he says, this wicked people. Remember what Jeremiah's question was last week when we talked about his big question? He says, why did the wicked prosper? So Jeremiah has in mind all these wicked people. Now God speaking through Jeremiah is saying, you are the wicked people because your pride has made you so far from me and so self-reliant. This final act then we see some important applications for our lives. This pride produced what? A refusal to listen to my word. The pride had made it so they would refuse to listen. Now remember, we already said God has intent on communicating to making himself known. His truth is important to him. He wants to make sure the truth is communicated. And the people heard the truth, but they didn't listen to the truth. Is there a difference between hearing and listening? See, the problem was not lack of hearing, the problem was not lack of God communicating it. The problem was lack of listening. The people refused, because of their pride, to listen to the truth. Again, I want to say it again. That doesn't mean they didn't hear it. There is certainly a difference between hearing and listening. How many of you are parents? You know that, right? Yeah, Mom, I hear you. Yeah, Dad, I hear you. But you know they're not listening. They hear the words, but nothing is absorbed where they say, yes, that's right and that's good and I'm going to go that direction. Yeah, I hear you. See, it's pride that keeps listening from happening in our lives. You know what? In our generation, I think what's unique for us right here is we have so much information coming at us, so many tweets and emails and texts and everything in front of us that it's very easy for us to hear a lot but listen to nothing we've like trained ourselves to to hear all these things and to see all these things but we're at a point where nothing really sinks in do you ever feel like that in your life i i'm a i'm a mile wide and an inch deep because i got all this stuff but nothing is being listened to now, here's what's really interesting. That word listen there on the screen. Hebrew word there translated listen. Same Hebrew word translated obey. Interesting. So if we don't listen, we don't what? Let's just say we hear a lot, but it never sinks deep enough to change any sort of action in our lives. And again, that's where the people of God were. They, they heard the, the word read, they heard God's truth communicated, but it never sank in, so they didn't obey. Every time I stand to preach, I'm aware that there are many people hearing me, but maybe very few listening. And of course, I recognize that I can't make anybody listen. And I also recognize the fact that it's not important that you listen to me, but that you listen to God's word that is presented. That's really the issue. So this wickedness that is birthed from this pride makes them unable to listen or they refuse to listen. And then they walk in the stubbornness of their own hearts. So again, not listening is the same as not obeying, so they're stuck in this stubbornness. This is, this is the way we are. This is what we're going to do and no need to change. So this pride and this stubbornness go hand in hand. Let me say it again. Pride and stubbornness go hand in hand. That's why most people who are stubborn see that as a positive attribute. Yeah, I'm a real stubborn person. Yeah. But Scripture never speaks of stubbornness as a positive attribute. Ever. 
See, this word in Scripture does not reflect anything positive. It, it refers to a person who is just set on doing it their way regardless of what God would say. And then the last step in this, it's this process of we're not going to listen. We become stubborn. And then in the end, we go to serve other gods. And we've talked about that idolatry already. So the pride is seen in refusing to listen, a stubbornness of heart, and then ultimately going after other gods, ultimately of their creation. The gods that would tell them what they want to hear because they're making these gods tell them what they want to hear, even as the New Testament talks about people gathering others who would just tell them what they want to hear. Don't tell us the truth, just tell us what we want to hear. They wanted to bow down to the gods of the nations around them, the gods that their craftsmen made, the gods who were overlaid with the gold that they refined. In other words, they wanted to worship themselves. That's ultimately what it came down to. Pride raises us up to the point that we're God. We'll do what we want to do. We don't need any input from God. That might just bother us a little bit. So the final step in this, they become so infected with pride that God was set aside and they went after the gods that they made pursuing their own intentions. And just one quick reference to the New Testament here. The Apostle Paul shows the same trajectory of pride working itself out in Romans chapter 1. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes... His eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him. I think we could put in there, even though they hear God, they don't listen to him or honor him or give thanks. They become futile in their speculation and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became what? Fools. And they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So we see this New Testament passage just shows the exact same path that the people of God went on in the Old Testament. So the whole intent then of this illustration, this performance, is for God to break down the pride, and ultimately he will break down the pride of his people. This last verse of the performance shows this contrast between how far the people have fallen and the great intention or desire of God. Listen to this last verse. For as the waste man clings to the waste of a man, so I made the whole household of Israel and the whole household of Judah to cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory. But what? They didn't listen. I have these great intentions for this people. I have this great intention for this people to be a people that are very, very close to me, a people that are very, very purposeful in their lives. And so there's two words, I think, stem from that last statement by God. First of all is intimacy. I intended these people to be very close to me, just like that waistband was tight and close and snug that's how I always intended my people to be to me, not distant. I was never intended to be on the fringe of their lives, but right in the center and very close to them. That's why when the tabernacle was created and the presence of God was brought into the camp of the people, where was the tabernacle? It was right in the center so that every time the people were out and about, they would say, there is God right in the center, right in the middle of us, right very close close to us. That's why God uses images in the Old Testament over and over again. He says, I'm your shepherd. Not a shepherd that's way up front leading you or back pushing you. I'm the shepherd that's right in the middle so you can hear my voice. He says, I'm your husband sharing intimacy with you. 
Church, that's why in the Old Testament the people went after other gods. What did God, what did God relate it to? He says, that is spiritual adultery because that is only for me. That's what I wanted to share with you and you gave yourselves to other gods. They had made other gods and went after them. But God says that was never that was never in my wildest dreams what I intended for you. You were to be in, intimate with me. Close to me. Now, I don't know how you do with that word intimacy. For some of you, that's a really uncomfortable word. But I just want to affirm that God intends to be intimate with us. As close as possible with us. If you in your mind relate intimacy to sexual relationship, that's good because that's what God says, I'm that close to you. As close as a man and woman could get, I'm that close to you. But let me ask you, do you experience that in your life? Do you experience that intimacy? Or is God this distant concept that, yeah, you refer to every once in a while? Some people relate intimacy with God with just gaining more information about him. And I would say that theology is very important about knowing God, but it's not necessarily what creates intimacy. Some people think of intimacy with God with this right setting or the right music or the right environment, and we feel very close to God. And I don't, I don't um, say that somehow that doesn't happen, and, and that's not a wonderful experience, but... Those are not the things that bring intimacy with God. What brings intimacy with God? Real intimacy with God is brought about when we trust God. When God says, do this, I know it's hard, and we do it, we just step a little bit closer to God. It's trust. Dean referred to Abraham. I would say to you that Abraham had an intimate relationship with God, and did he trust God? Indeed, he did. Every day he had to keep walking up to that mountain and says, I'm just going to do this, and I think God's going to meet me there. See, the people of God in the Old Testament, that was their issue. They didn't think God could take care of them. They thought the other nations could do a better job. So they looked to the other nations and the other gods, and so the result was there was no intimacy with their God. And let me say this, trust is easy when life is easy, right? Yeah, I'll trust God. Everything's going well. I'll trust God. But here's what God does. He says, no, I'm, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it difficult because I want to be close to you because I want you to trust me, and I want to be deeply connected with you. So I'm not going to make it easy all the time. There's an old hymn that says this, Every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. And then there's this last phrase, those who trust him wholly. How many know how it ends? Find him wholly true. That's how we become intimate. We trust. We say, okay, I'll do that. I'll walk that road. I'll be obedient. I'll do the thing that doesn't seem natural. I'll make the sacrifice when it doesn't seem like I have anything to sacrifice. I will do that, and if we'll do that, if we'll take that step of trust, the end result of that will be intimacy with God. Do you trust God today? Do you? Do you trust him with your family? Do you trust him with your health? Here's a big one. Do you trust him with your money? Yeah, I just stepped on toes, I know that. Yeah, I trust you, God, but this is all mine, and I need to keep it all. I can't give any of it because, well, I won't have enough. What's that called? Trust? No. 
And so we wonder why we hoard stuff and we hoard money and, and we're, we're not generous givers. And we say, why don't I feel close to God? Well, you don't trust him. You're not being obedient. Another word that comes out of this, in addition to intimacy, is worship. That they might be for me a people for renown, for praise, and for glory. See, God made these people to be intimate with him, and God made these people to worship him and to bring worship through them to him, a people for renown. That means I want to give you a name. But it's not your name. I want you to lift up my name. I want, to, I want you to be a people of praise, not to bring praise to yourself, but praise to me. I want you to be a people for glory, not for your own glory, but for the glory of God. You see, that's always been the intent of God for his people. He chose them to be in relationship with him and that they might worship him and then represent him to the world. Even the nation of Israel in Isaiah chapter 42, it says, there to be a light to the nations a light that points to me. So understand that now we as the church, we have been grafted into that. Understand, we don't replace Israel. Nobody replaces Israel. Israel is always God's chosen people. But we've been grafted into this same purpose, to be intimate with him, to be worshiping him that's why jesus says abide in me stay close to me that's why jesus says you're my bride i'm your husband let me be intimate with you that is why scripture says over and over again we exist for one purpose only and that's for his glory there's a passage in peter that borrows from all of these things we've just been talking about here about the nation of Israel and it's not about the nation of Israel it's really about the church so he says to the church he says to us you are a chosen race he says you are a royal priesthood he says you are a holy nation you are a people for God's own possession why so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light that was the intention of god's old testament people we've been then grafted into that whole purpose today as his new testament people to proclaim the excellencies of christ to say that he is good and he is beautiful and we do that when life is good amen but do we do we do that when life is difficult church that's when it really means something <laughs> If we, say, if we say, God, you're really good and life is really good and everything's nice, well, that's good, but people expect that. But when your life is hard and difficult and you're sick and you're struggling and you say, God, you're good and you're beautiful, that's wonderful to see. All right. One last illustration, if I could. Imagine for a moment that your job, your task in life, was to stand along the roadside and grab people's attention and direct them to a particular attraction or a destination. Would you be excited about that? Well, it probably depends on what the destination is, right? What are you directing people to? So hang with me here. What if your job was to direct people to the Grand Canyon? The beauty of the Grand Canyon. One of the most spectacular sights literally in all the world. And your job was to direct them and say, come and see this. This is amazing. This is outstanding. You will stand there with your mouth open just in awe of the beauty. Come here. Or what if you were directing people to the world's largest twine ball <laughs> yeah it's right down the road go if you want to so if you were directing people to the Grand Canyon there's a certain exhilaration a certain sort of passion go and see this because this is absolutely amazing as opposed to yeah go see the ball of twine right over there 
What's your life about? What is your life about? Are you proclaiming the excellencies, the beauty of this amazing God that called you to be his? Or is it about a ball of twine? See, in the end, the people of God in the Old Testament got so sidetracked, they were in pursuit of literally balls of twine, little wooden statues, little things that they had to nail up to make sure they stood, things that were so powerless and pointless, and that's what their lives became about. And they lost sight of the majesty of their God. I dare say we do that same thing. We get all wrapped up in things that are just like this ball of twine, and we wonder why we feel so distant from God and why life just becomes this drudgery. We've lost sight of the great God that has called us. And not just called us, but called us to intimacy. May God remind us today as his people, amen, the great God that we serve. We're going to sing about this great God, and, and I so much appreciate our musicians that help us then respond and sing about this furious, amazing love that God has for us and this majesty and holiness that he is. So let's respond as our musicians come. Father God, thank you so much, again, for who you are, for your grace to us and your love for us. and. Uh, it's an amazing thing to think that you have called us to be yours. You've chosen us. You have made us yours through Jesus Christ. Lord, remind us of that again. Lord, lift our eyes up to the splendor of who you are. Lord, keep us from pride. Lord, we recognize again that it's in you that we live and move and even have the breath that we have. So receive these statements of worship, Lord, knowing that that's what you've made us to do, is to worship you even in song, as we do now. Amen.